Okay. Good morning uh, or afternoon or evening, depending where in the world you're joining us from. Thank you so much for tuning into Plan G, Conserving Mexico's Threatened Good Eats. My name is Michael Edmondstone. I'm the Communications and Engagement Lead at Shoal. And this webinar marks the launch of a, a really exciting new program that's led by the Universidad Michoacana de San Nicolas de Hidalgo in Morelia, Mexico, uh, and Chester Zoo, the Good Eared Working Group, Shoal, and plenty of local community representation around Mexico to mobilize urgent conservation action for the highly threatened group of Mexican good eared fishes. Uh, I'll let the, the panelists and the presenters really go into uh, the details of the Mexican good eards, but a, a quick kind of rundown that there are 40 species of them with 13 listed as critically endangered, 14 as endangered, and nearly 90% of the group are threatened with extinction, making them one of the most threatened groups of fishes in the world. Uh, you have probably spotted some of the Day of the Dead theme promotional material being shared across social media. This is a nod not just to the fact that Dia de los Muertos is celebrated across Mexico uh, at this time of year and that this is a Mexican program, but it's also symbolic of the idea that these highly endangered fish species are kind of coming back from the dead as they're given the opportunity to bounce back from the brink of extinction. We have a tremendously exciting lineup of, uh, of speakers today who will discuss this group of fishes, the threats facing them, and crucially, the vital work that's being done to save them from extinction. I'll introduce each of them in just a minute, but first, uh, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we're, we're recording this session, and it will be available after the, after the webinar um, on the Shoal website and uh, I'm sure other places as well. Uh, and we'll be taking questions throughout the event uh, through the chat function. Uh, when you message in, please just let us know who you are, where you're joining us from, and whether your question is to be directed to one of the panelists in particular. We should have around 20 minutes to half an hour at the end to chat through the questions. Uh, and Ellie will be in the background, beavering away, checking the chat, and we'll get onto as many of the questions as we have time for. Uh, if we don't get the chance to answer your question, please follow up with an email uh, after the event and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Message me on info at shellconservation.org with the question and whether you'd like the question to be directed to one of the panelists in particular. So without further ado, the panelists, we're extremely lucky to be joined by a whole host of experts from, from Mexico and, and Europe. Um, Paul Bamford, the regional field Program Manager for Latin America at Chester Zoo. Topis Contreras Macbeth, the Mexico co-chair of the Freshwater Conservation Committee. Um, Areli Ramirez Garcia, an ichthyologist at the Universidad Michoacana de San Nicolas de Hidalgo. Perla Carolina Espinosa Gomez, a representative from Guardianas del Rio Teuchitlan. Becky Goodwin, lead aquarist at Chester Zoo. Harmony Patricio, Conservation Program Manager at Shoal. And I'm breathing a big sigh of relief because Michael Kirk, the co-founder and chair of the Goodyear Working Group, has just joined us after uh, a, a few technical issues. But Michael's in the room now, so that's fantastic. Um, yeah, over to you guys. If Maybe, Paul, if you introduce yourself first. Uh, hi. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, Paul Bamford, uh, Regional Field Programs Manager for Chester Zoo, dialing in from North Wales today. Hola, yo soy Topil Sin Contreras uh, from the University of Morelos in Central Mexico. And as Michael mentioned, I'm also co-chair of the Freshwater Conservation Committee at IUCN. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Can, can you hear me? Of course, sorry. I'm fine a little bit with techniques. My name is Michael Kirk from Austria, and my talk will be about the... Uh, uh, the I got, forgot my talks. Topic, sorry. Maybe the potential limits of exceptional networks in conservation of Mexican fish. Hello, uh, I'm sorry, I have problems with the computer. I mean the phone. So uh, I am Areli Ramirez Garcia. 
and I am from Mexico in the Universidad Michoacán de San Nicolás de Hidalgo. Is that everyone? Everyone's introduced themselves. Not quite yet. No, me neither. <laughs> Should I go next? So I'm Becky from Chester Zoo, um, and I'm also the EUP coordinator for Good Aid, so that's why I'm involved. Hi, everyone. I'm Harmony Patricio. I'm the conservation program manager for Shoal, and I'm also a member of the Freshwater Conservation Committee for IUCN. All right, brilliant. Thanks so much. And I think Paul's going to kick us off with his presentation, first of all. Um, yeah, just one, one last person who hasn't introduced themselves. Uh, Pedela, um, you haven't said hello yet. OK, I'm sorry. Hi, my name is Pedela Espinosa. I'm from Chichitla, Jalisco. And uh, actually, I'm a student from the Universidad of Guadalajara. Uh, the title of my presentation is Conserving the Common Home, Example of Community Work to Conserve the Chitlan River and its Native Species. Thanks, Pedler. Um, okay, thanks, Michael. Uh, I just want to start off just by saying uh, a, a huge thanks to Michael Edmondstone for organizing this webinar today. Um, the uh, I think more work has gone into the webinar than went into the workshop to come up with this conservation plan. Uh, so uh, thanks, Mike, for, for all your efforts with that. Uh, OK, so the, the first presentation then, um, which uh, will be mine, is uh, Plan G, an action plan for the conservation of Mexico's good aid fishes. Uh, hopefully you're all seeing my PowerPoint on screen right now. Can I just, uh, Mike, maybe can you just give me a thumbs up if that's coming through? Okay, yep, loud and clear. Okay, um, so let's just make sure I can scroll, there we go. So a quick introduction, first of all, why are we here talking about uh, good aid fishes today? Um, there's a, a few reasons why this, uh, this particular group of fish, we, we're talking about a, a subfamily uh, of fish that are endemic to Mexico. And there's a, a few reasons why they are deserving uh, needing of conservation uh, attention. So the, the Goodyeards collectively, they're, they're a family of uh, fishes that exist in, in the United States and in Mexico. The subfamily Good A and A, uh, which just for the, the sake of ease of pronunciation more than anything else, I'll refer to from here on inwards as Mexican Good Aids or uh, Mexican Good Aid fishes. Uh, they're endemic to central Mexico. Um, there are 40 species, if we include one species that, that's extinct already. Um, they have a, a, a tendency to be very highly microendemic. So they're, they're small fish species. They're not very, from a sort of layman's point of view, not very spectacular. They're very often described as little brown fish. Um, you tend to get one species or two or three species which all exist within one lake or one small pond or one river and nowhere else. So they, they have very, very limited distributional ranges. Um, and they're also evolutionary, quite unique. Um, in that they're live bearers. So they have a whole bunch of anatomical adaptations which enable them to give birth to live young rather than lay eggs. So they, they fit under the cat category of, of um, what ZSL have termed the, the, the edge um, the, the, the edge scores. So that means uh, evolutionary distinct globally um, globally endangered. So they're, they're weird and they're very highly threatened, basically. Um, of the 40 species, as I mentioned, one is extinct. Uh, two are extinct in the wild, 13 critically endangered, 14 endangered, six vulnerable, and only four, so only 10% of them are uh, near threatened. So they, they are all under quite a high threat cat category under the IUCN red list. And um, as well as their, their kind of intrinsic value from a conservation point of view. Also, because they depend so highly on the freshwater ecosystems where they exist, their conservation goes hand in hand with the conservation of these water bodies, of these lakes, rivers, and the wider watersheds around them, which, of course, then resonates um, with human well-being. 
uh, and the wider ecological well-being of the areas that they inhabit. So they, they have this potential for being flagships of conservation on a landscape scale, uh, as well as um, as well as their own uh, individual conservation basis on a, on a conservation uh, need on a, on a species scale as well. Um, now, why is Chester Zoo involved with uh, Good Aids? Well, this is a story that is much has been going on for much longer um, than I've been present at Chester Zoo. I, I uh, took on the role of uh, leading Chester Zoo's Latin American uh, regional program in 2019, but we Chester Zoo institutionally have been working with the Mexico Fish Ark. Um, we'll be hearing from Adeli from the Fish Ark a little bit later on. Uh, we've been working with them since uh, the year 2000, supporting the development of the largest uh, ex situ captive collection of uh, Mexican good aids in Mexico. Um, and from between the years 2014, 2018, we were involved in uh, working with them on developing. And we also supported through through funding, through technical support, the successful reintroduction project of the tequila split fin uh, to the Telchitlan River in Jalisco State. Uh, Adeli will be telling us a bit more about that project later on, so I won't get into that in detail. Um, and also more recently, we've been working with them on the reintroduction of another species in the same location, uh, which is the golden skiffia. Both of these species, um, similar to the description I, I mentioned before, though, both microendemic to these water bodies. So they existed there, nowhere else. When they went extinct from that river, they were, to all intents and purposes, lost from the wild until these reintroduction initiatives began. So this, this Plan G, as we've we've um, started to call it affectionately now, um, the, the, Mexica, the um, conservation plan, uh, sorry, the plan for the conservation of uh, Mexico's good aid fishes, this was really born out of the success of the tequila split fin reintroduction. Um, and it, it kind of stemmed from the, the question of what's next. Um, We've successfully reintroduced one species to the wild. When I say successfully, that means that that population has become established. They are reproducing within the river. It's a self-sustaining population now. But in the Mexico Fish Ark Laboratory, the Aquatic Biology Laboratory of uh, Michoacan State University's um, biology faculty, they have, as I mentioned before, the largest ex situ collection of these fish in on Mexican soil. Um, so what's the conservation value of all of these different species of fish in tanks uh, in a city in Morelia State? Uh, and that led us to conversations with um, the IUCN's uh, Freshwater Conservation Committee with Toppies, who we'll be hearing from a little bit later on, uh, with Shoal as well, who've organized this webinar today, uh, with the Gudeid Working Group, Michael Kirk, we'll be hearing from later on as well. And it seemed that this was a, a concern what, what's the bigger story with conservation of, of good aid fishes and, and I, I guess in a wider sense, freshwater conservation in, in Mexico in general terms. I think Topis is going to be telling us a bit about that later on. Um, what can we do to start to address the, these issues from to start looking at the bigger picture? So that's what brought us together with a whole host of other stakeholders, um, researchers, NGOs, zoos, aquaria, uh, government, uh, public offices, and, and, and more, uh, to meet in some of us in person in the city of Morelia in Mexico a, exactly a year ago on, on these very dates. Uh, some attendees uh, took, part, took, took part in a workshop online. So it was a, it was a hybrid workshop. Um, and we we followed the principles that are established uh, by the conservation planning specialist groups, principles and steps. Um, something else that I'm going to mention, but not go into today because I don't have the time, but I will. I think Jamie Copsey from CPSG is in the audience today. So, Jamie, if you want to share a link to the principles and steps document uh, on the CPSG website in the chat, do feel free to do so. Uh, if not, if anyone wants to know about more about that, um, you can Google uh, CPSG. Uh, principles and steps and 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 Google will take you to uh, the document that explains uh, the CPSG process. Uh, so we applied that process uh, in this uh, four day workshop in, in Morelia last year and, and we we um, 
came up with this plan, which we we structured around the theory of change that uh, Topis had published earlier that same year, um, which divided, focused on um, the conservation of uh, Mexico's freshwater fishes in a wider sense, not just good aids, uh, but it, it divided a proposed course of action into, into four main pillars, which were conservation management, restoration, reintroductions, um, the third one we took as being research in, in the paper that Topis published, it, it was actually searching for and confirming presence or absence of species for which their um, status was, was currently unclear. Um, and finally, communication and outreach. So what I'm going to do now very quickly with the time I've got remaining is just give you a very quick overview of this plan and what it looks like. Uh, so I'll apologize. The next few slides are going to be a little bit arid. Um, so first of all, the scope of the plan. So the plan includes all extant species of Mexican good aid fishes. What we mean by all extant is, is basically there are questions about the taxonomy of some of the species or it's questions about the conservation status of some of the species as well. Some might be extinct in the wild. We haven't got it recorded yet. Some species might actually be two species, etc. So we've used that word extant to allow us to adapt the scope of the plan as knowledge about the subfamily uh, changes and the exact status of the different species changes. And we've established a time frame for the plan of um, 10 years. Our vision statement is that all extant Mexican good aid fish species show stable or increasing population trends. Their habitats are under conservation management and the threats that affect them have been reduced through collaborative efforts of all stakeholder groups. So we're bringing in not only the individual species, but also the, the context of the ecosystem, the habitat that they live within as well. Um, and we've established four measures of success, which will allow us to monitor how the plan is doing in terms of its conservation impact. So these four measures are the percentage of good aid species, which have a stable or increasing population trend. It's worth mentioning at the moment that um, the majority, I think all species at the moment are declining. Um, so reversing that population trend. Uh, second, the percentage of priority locations which are under conservation management. Um, so that there's a big um, gap at the moment in terms of the, the amount of, the, of, of water bodies where good aids live, which are actually being protected on a habitat level. Uh, third, the percentage of priority locations that have been newly designated as protected areas. Uh, and finally, the percentage of threatened species, so those which are uh, on the IUCN red list as vulnerable, uh, endangered, critically endangered or extinct in the wild, for which it is technically deemed necessary that are protected within managed ex situ populations and are available for re reinforcing or reintroducing wild populations where needed. So that technically deemed necessary is important. There needs to be a justification a, a precise uh, rationale for which keeping them ex situ um, in, in, in collections in aquaria will somehow contribute to the in situ conservation of the species within their natural habitat. Okay, so the um, these four sort of pillars that we've structured the actions around, as I mentioned, uh, conservation management, uh, <clears throat> Um, reintroductions and population restoration, research and uh, communications and outreach. They are divided into different strategy lines. And I'll just quickly run through the strategy lines now. Each one of these strategy lines then goes down into individual actions, which have specific targets, um, indicators, uh, timeframes, etc. But I'll just look at the strategy lines because otherwise I'll be here until next week probably um so thematic area one is conservation management uh the strategy lines are first of all establishing a functional government structure for the 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 the, the um conservation plan as a whole uh second undertaking a detailed analysis and plan for good aids plus the actors needs and instruments um that are necessary to develop conservation actions uh, third, establishing a portfolio of projects aimed at the protection of priority species and priority sites. Fourth, um, for all projects 
proposed within the project portfolio to have been implemented with priority projects completed uh, and fifth and final for mechanisms to have been deployed to evaluate these projects and their impact. So this first uh, thematic area really focuses on the project management within the plan. Um, second, research. Um, so this is about answering all of the knowledge gaps of which there are still many. There's a lot of information that we still need to be able to actually plan in finer detail. Uh, so number one, looking at systematics and uh, distribution, uh, establishing a definitive number of species and, and distribution for each one. Second, species biology, uh, updating the information base on all of the species. Um, third, inclusion of the species in the Mexican protected species list. So there are a few species species which are on the IUCN red list, but which are not yet recognized nationally. Uh, fourth, habitat studies, getting that information that we need to guide the, the habitat protection work in the wild. Uh, fifth, husbandry, um, information about how to look after these fish better in captivity in order to ensure sustainable populations, uh, sustainable ex situ populations. Sixth, hu human dimensions of good aid conservation. So understanding how people who live alongside good aids um, within the habitat interact with them and what are those human factors which influence on their conservation. And finally, conservation evidence. And this one is all about uh, research to uh, monitor and evaluate the implementation of the plan, find out what works, what doesn't, and then to share that more widely so that can be available for other stakeholders, either working with good aids or working with similar species elsewhere in the world. The third thematic area then was uh, restoration, and reintroduction, uh, fewer strategy lines here. Um, the first two are focused on ex situ management, so ex situ husbandry, um, taking all that information that comes from the husbandry research, which I mentioned in the previous uh, thematic area, and applying that to make sure that ex situ populations are maintained as a resource for future reintroductions or for population reinforcement. Uh, second, population management. So this is really the, the work that we do so well in, in the zoo and aquarium community, which is managing community, managing populations of the different species across different collections to make sure those populations are genetically viable. Uh, and then the third one is the in situ work. So the in situ habitat protection, restoration uh, and population reintroductions and reinforcement. Then finally, and I'm running out of time, Mike, so I'll be really quick. Uh, the uh, last thematic area is communication and outreach. So there, there are two uh, main strategy lines here. The first one is to develop a broad outreach and engagement plan uh, to which would be delivered uh, both uh, locally to the uh, the areas where the good air populations occur, as well as nationally in Mexico and internationally um, with that sort of multi-tiered structure. And finally, uh, the last strategy line is training. So uh, using the knowledge base and the skills that already exist to ensure that there, there is um, good local capacity to work for uh, good air conservation uh, within their habitat. Um, I'll skip the governance bit because I'm out of time, but we've established a, a, a government structure, which includes people who are involved in the workshop and others who've been called on since then as well. Um, we intend to meet online every six months and have face-to-face -face meetings every two years to check implementation, uh, measure the impact, um, and see how we can share the results of, of the project. Uh, and with that, I will come to a very speedy conclusion uh, to my presentations. Apologies, it's been a, a little bit rushed, but it's a lot to get to in 15 minutes. Uh, my email address is there, so if anybody wants more information, do feel free to jot that down and uh, to drop me a line. Mike, I hope I haven't gone on too long. No, no, that's perfect. Thanks, Paul. It is a hell of a lot to get through. It really is a lot. It was a, a three-day workshop um, of lots of strategizing. So it's very difficult to content, condense that into 15 minutes, but thank you. Um, I, I've just heard that the, the chat function has been a bit glitchy, but it's definitely up and running. So feel free, please, to just um, say who you are, say where you're, say where you're joining from. And um, yeah, that'd be great. Thanks. Um, and I think next is Topas. Yeah. Let me share my screen. You got it now? Can you see my screen? 
Yeah. Yeah, see. we can see you, Tobis. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about IUCN's role in the conservation of Mexican freshwater fishes. Uh, I love this photo. I love uh, good dates. Uh, there's, I think they're really nice, beautiful, sexy fishes. And there's a really interesting uh, quality about this, uh, these fishes and they're live bearing fishes. I took this photo of a female of uh, Giraldinitis Multiradiatos in San Paula National Park. And we were working with a community task force and, and they brought it to me, put it in, a, I put it in a small uh, aquarium and I took the photo and I was a bit weary uh, and because, you know, it was not swimming very well. I put it back in the lake, said, oh, I hope it, it makes it. And um, it definitely didn't make it, but because that uh, lake dried up this year and that's something that's happening many sites where good age live. I mean, it's uh, something we need to work on. We need to uh, do more to protect these beautiful fishes. So I'm going to give you a little bit of story, uh, of uh, history. In, in 1998, we organized this uh, <clears throat> Liberian fish meeting and uh, fish conservation course, uh, where we started discussing about uh, how or what we need to do to conserve Mexican freshwater fishes. And, and you can see Gordon Reed uh, there, and there, it's uh, Heather Hall, she was at uh, London Sioux Aquarium. Uh, Brian Zimmerman was in that meeting. And at the course uh, uh, by Peter Burgess and David Price, you can see this guy with a, the red cap, that's Omar. He was, I think he was just a bachelor student there or just finished there his uh, bachelor's degree. And who would have thought that 20 years later, a little bit more than 20 years later, he would be one of the leading authorities in good aid evolution, taxonomy and conservation. So after these meetings, we kept on discussing the need to do more regarding to fresh water fish conservation. And uh, we are, uh, we were invited in March of 2005 by Gordon Reed to Chester Sioux, that's the old logo of Chester, and to talk about establishing, possibly establishing a freshwater fish specialist group. There were no freshwater oriented uh, specialist groups in, in IUCN. And this, of course, uh, didn't uh, make, make it easy to you know, promote freshwater fish conservation. So. In this meeting, we had some really, really interesting people. Paul Skelton from South Africa. We had a Richard Maiden from the United States. My really good friend, Roberto Reyes from Brazil. And uh, well, of course, Will Darwell from, from IUCN. And, and uh, this, uh, this meeting was uh, facilitated by Oni Byers. She's, she was excellent. Uh, and uh, well, we set the basis for the creation of Freshwater Fish Specialist Group. We, and then the following three years we met in Chester, the group got larger uh, and, and we had more uh, strategic planning meetings. And since then we've been working on this, on these issues. Then in 2008, as Simon Stewart took over the SSC, they wanted to have someone with a, a freshwater orientation in the steering committee of the SSC. So I was invited into the SSC in the first meeting in Glam. Uh, I raised my hand and said, we need a freshwater conservation committee as you have with marine and for invertebrates and for plants. So uh, he said, okay, you have to work on it. And Tom Brooks and Mahim Haddad uh, volunteered to help me out. We went to a site meeting and started drafting some notes on how a uh, freshwater conservation community would work. And then, you know, I came back to Mexico, drafted a bigger document, presented the next year in, in, a, in a meeting we had in Venezuela. And in 2010, we created a Freshwater Conservation Committee. We had then in uh, 2011, uh, a planning, big planning meeting, and you can see Harmony's there, and my good friend and co-chair, Ian Harrison, many other people, uh, not only fish experts, and, and you know, this this whole uh, planning process was supported by Gretel Aguilar, 
who is now director of general director of IUCN. She was very keen on helping us in this in this whole process. One of the main activities we decided to work on was, as had been done with amphibians and other groups, do a global freshwater fish assessment. And we, you know, we started working on this. It was not easy. It's about eighteen thousand species, but uh, in two thousand and sixteen, uh, we received a huge funding from Toyota, <clears throat> and just this year, we're uh, uh, finalizing the global freshwater fish assessment. We're already working with Catherine Sawyer on a publication uh, to talk about this landmark uh, event. You know, having all the all the freshwater fish success is something really important. And with that funds, we managed to do the Mexican freshwater fish assessment. So we uh, prepared the, the, whole, uh, the whole documentation. We had a workshop in 2018 in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And uh, as you can see Tim Lyons there, he was really, really uh, tremendous in helping get this done. He still is, he's a really good partner of us. So we are, we assess 556 Mexican freshwater fish species, but uh, we want to do more. So now we know, and, and uh, Paul just mentioned, how many species are threatened, which are which are burnable. Uh, we we know that there, there are about 100 Mexican data deficient freshwater fish species. We need to work more on those. And of course, the go dates has, have always been a central part of our interest in, in conservation. Uh, we also know where the threats are, what the main threats are. Uh, and this this is very important, but because if we're gonna go into conservation action, this is very important to know what's happening with the species and, and what, uh, how, what can we do to uh, protect them. But originally in the Freshwater Conservation Committee, they, our, our role was just to advise, uh, to participate, to communicate. And we, uh, not that we were not allowed, but the, okay, don't, don't do planning or acting. But since John Paul Rodriguez took uh, charge of the SSC, he's been promoting the Species Conservation Act. So we don't want to be just narrators of uh, what's happening to the species. We want to plan and we want to act. So now that we have assessed, uh, assessed the species, uh, we're doing action plans like the one we're presenting today. And we are also have some conservation action on the field. Of course, to do this, as in the case of this uh, this document, we are networking with all our partners from different levels of government, NGOs, and others to, to make this happen. Uh, with this uh, species conservation cycle in mind, we've done a lot in the, in the past uh, four years to uh, start doing conservation projects for fishes in Mexico. Uh, this is something going to be out in the on the freshwater fish species group bulletin. So we're working right now uh, on several projects in in Mexico. We're in in northern Mexico. We have a desert fish working group with uh, chaired by Nelly da Barajas uh, from uh, Data Mares. We're working with Cipriano Eremos, no, in over there. Uh, with Mariana Mateos from Texas A and M University and funding from uh, MBZ, we're working with uh, Pasilepsis Jack Schultz. Uh, we're working several projects in Mexico. Our, our research group led by Humberto Mejia is, we're working in Sampuala, where we're working with the dark and split in there. We're working in a rewilding project in one of the most important springs in Mexico, Las Estacas. We're uh, recently been uh, working with Asiana Salvatoris, a critically endangered uh, fish in 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 Oaxaca. Uh, next week we'll be start we'll start working with uh, several species uh, uh, in, uh, in some crater lakes in, in Puebla. We've been supported there by a group of uh, 
diverse in the, in the local government in African Safari. And we're, at, we're also working on some other projects uh, with uh, the Bristol Zoological so Society. You know, we're working on a project on the uh, flock of Cyprinodons in the Yucatan in, in Lake Chichacana. We also have a with Zoological uh, Society of London, we're working on a Stink in the Wild Cyprinodons. Uh, Omar is involved in that in that project also, and, and you know, uh, we want to bring back also some Cyprinodons. And of course, this big area in Central Mexico is related to this Good Aid Working Group, where we're doing we did this strategic planning process, but also. Uh, we're working on a specific uh, proposal, and uh, I, I really will be talking to you about what it's already been done there, and we're working with several people to make a, a bigger project in this region. So it's a very exciting time for Mexican freshwater fishes. We want more, uh, more people involved, more projects uh, related to these uh, these issues, and, and uh, we hope people in the audience are interested in working in Mexican freshwater fishes. Of course, we've been in, uh, strengthening in our network. This is just a simplified version of, of our work, our network right now. Some of the people in this in this meeting are represented here, Shaw, Rewal, uh, but we're working, of course, with the Bristol Zoological so Society, Cedacel, Albuquerque, Indianapolis, Money Boom, She's, she's been excellent since uh, since she she went into the uh, Indianapolis uh, organization with advanced like never before in uh in doing conservation projects and producing materials etc. And we have a really interesting uh, and exciting news for you. We've uh, recently created in Shade Aquarium in Chicago the the well. Global Freshwater Conservation uh, Lab over there. We recently uh, appointed Jasmine Quintana to lead this this uh, this center, and uh, the main focus of this uh, this uh, center will be on freshwater species. And in this, the uh, pre, uh, first two years, we'll be working in Central America. So we're very excited at this. With all this. And what we're working on, we want to create, or we're working on the creation of the Mexican Freshwater Biodiversity Conservation Alliance. We're, it's biodiversity because we're not only working with freshwater fishes, we're working with axolots, uh, crayfish, and even freshwater sponges. So this, uh, this document we're presenting today is aligned with the Global Species Action Plan that IUCN presented just 10 days ago. This is uh, an act, uh, action plan that's uh, related to the post-2030 biodiversity framework. If we are to bend the biodiversity curve, we need to work more. We need to work more in developing action plans and conserving species. And uh, we have the, our president at IUCN, Razan Al-Mubarak, has always been supportive of freshwater fish conservation. She has, uh, she's a species person. And uh, even through the Mohammed bin Zayed uh, uh, Species Conservation Fund, she has supported many of our projects, but also in general terms related to the way uh, IUCN is thinking now about conservation. She's, she supported us all the way. And then I'm about done. Thank you very much. Been glad to to present this part of the of what we're doing in Mexican freshwater fish conservation. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Thomas. And I think next we have uh, Mike Kirk, who's going to talk a bit about the potential and limits of ex situ networks in Mexican freshwater fish conservation. Over to you, Mike. Well, I hope everybody can hear me now. 
Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. And do you see my presentation? I hope so. Give me a second. Okay. So should see my presentation if, it, if I'm correct. Yeah, I, I need to apologize before because uh, yesterday I tried to fix everything with my laptop, with my computer, but anyhow, it didn't work. So I switched over to Omar's computer. Everything worked properly. But this day I didn't get access to the, to the analyst and I was struggling a lot. And definitely in the very last second I was able to join you. And so I was a little bit off road. So I hope you forgive me. And it's okay for you when, yeah, when I was a little bit struggling. It's normally not my way, but yeah, this day was very special for me. Anyway, uh, the first slide that I wanted to present is you about the title Prevention Limits of Ex situ Networks of Mexican Freshwater Fish Conservation. Uh, two species that are iconic. Meanwhile, you have Scyphia francisii on the left side and uh, Soconeticus tequila on the right side. Two species that have been reintroduced in the wild successfully or in the process of being less ex successfully reintroduced. But the most important thing, and that's why, why I took this for this Exito network presentation, in both of these species, hobbyists as well as zoos or institutions like public aquariums, but also in universities had a big part to play. And without the hobbyist part and without the zoological part and without the university part, it would have not been possible to bring these species back. So networks are essential for bringing fish back, essential for freshwater, fresh, freshwater fish conservation. <clears throat> Sorry, freshwater fish conservation in general. <clears throat> uh, for the first slide, I took a, a very, <laughs> let's say, provoking picture. The tilapia are in the hands of people being, being released. But I didn't take this because of tilapia. It's just uh, I talked to several people in the last years, and not even hobbyists, but also people from zoos, and they have a very glorified way of thinking how ex situ conservation, ex situ breeding works. Everybody's thinking, when you talk to the people, yeah, we're breeding fish at home, then you take this fish, put them in a plane, fly to Mexico and put them in the lakes and everything is fine. But we will just hear later on from, from Arely, it's not working this way. There are a lot of, of issues that we have to, to overcome. And it's not like bringing fish back into wild by taking them from the aquarium. I know that fish in the aquarium uh, work differently than fish in the wild. We know that we have different diseases in the aquariums that shouldn't be brought to the wild. So it's not like taking the fish back to the wild. But so this this process of, despite of having on the left side two guppy males that will not breed, uh, the way from the aquarium directly to the wild, this is not working. But on the other hand, people ask me always, uh, but what, why do I breed fish then at home? Why do I breed threatened fish at home when I cannot bring them back to the wild? What is my role in this process? And there are many, many, many possibilities. And I just, because there are too many, I just picked out two processes, two actions where hobbyists can contribute by breeding fish and observing the fish and seeing what's going on with them. There are many, many more where networks can contribute or just throw them down in the, in the lower lines, like creating awareness, also fundraising or going to the habitats together as a group and seeing what's going on there and different things more. Uh, but the most important things that I think were hobbyists and, and zoos can contribute and work together is, yeah, helping helping to create something like, like backup populations, for example. Just imagine you having a, a fish species in the wild, everything is quite okay, the fish is threatened, you know, the habitat is threatened, and suddenly something happens, the habitat's getting worse and worse, the fish species is extinct. And when you don't have any backup populations at home in aquaria, you have no chance to bring the fish back. And this is one of the things where I say the hobbyists or networks in general, including zoos, uh, very important to have to bring the possibility to, to help us to bring this fish back in the worst case scenario that we are not hoping that is coming to, to our life again. Uh, but you can see there's a potential. It's not, not like uh, bringing the fish back directly, but potential founder populations, which means we need populations that raise, that give... Uh, 
that produce fish that we can bring to the wild. So we're not bringing the fish back from the backup populations directly to the wild, but we bring them together and try from uh, from from localities outside of the habitat, from semi-captive areas to breed the fish there, and from there bring the fish back to the to the habitat, the offspring. I have to apologize. I'm really, really nervous because this is a really big step for me sitting here and, and talking about, yeah, probably the most important thing in my life, good food, eat conservation. And though I prepared very properly, I'm, I'm really a little bit off road. I hope you apologize. But this backup populations that I have in mind work a little bit like this uh, seeds, let's say, uh, the seed walls that we, we, for example, have in the Arctic systems, where we store a lot of seeds there for the future when something is happening with our planet, that we can bring the seeds back to the wild and go on breeding them and raise uh, corn and, and crops and crop and whatever we need. It's a little bit different that works in fish. We cannot freeze them. We can. The only thing we can do is breed them. And when somebody is breeding fish, you know what's going to happen. They are, they, they are changing in behavior, they're changing in appearance. So we need to cover with these problems and so just put out one species that's for me easier to demonstrate what, what, what I was thinking of. Uh, somebody's getting a couple of fish, in this case it's uh, Skiffy multipunctata, but he has bad experience with uh, sharing fish with other ones, you know, all this lost. So he thinks of keeping the fish in the aquarium, breed this threatened fish and preserving them for backup populations for future reintroductions. And he realizes, okay, when I breed this fish, they suddenly split, the males look different, it's nice to observe them, but I keep them in the aquarium. And what happens after a while is you lose some of the of the varieties, some of the iconic ones, the yellow ones, or the ones without spots disappear. And after a while, a few generations, all fish look similar, look like this, for example. And you lose a lot of genetic variety. But on the other hand, when you start with the same population of fish and you say, okay, my first offspring, I'm going to spread them with other people. I'm going to, to share them with other ones and create different lineages and start to uh, work as in, in a network. Uh, the similar thing is happening. You also get these lineages. You also get these different lines and maybe you're also losing some of the population, some of the, of the varieties. It's nothing different than before, but you have different aquariums and you have different varieties in different aquariums. Why? Because this, the situations in every aquarium is different and also the founder populations that you get from the breeder are different. And when you're lucky, like we are in this in this example, then we have different color forms in different aquariums coming from the same, the same original pairs and we get different lineages. But isn't this something that we don't want? We have we know in the nature we need variety, we need biological, uh, uh, genetical diversity, but we have these lineages in aquarium. Isn't this completely the opposite of what we want? We have to think about what an aquarist needs and what the nature needs. Nature needs variety, of course. We need biological diversity, the possibility to adapt on habitat changes and the changes of the environment. But the aquarist, on the other hand, he needs stable, well-producing, healthy populations. And only when these healthy populations are working, he can produce fish. And when he can produce fish, we have something that we can use for the future. But how does this help us when we have different color varieties, for example, or different genetic lineages? Just an example, we we distribute Skiffy or Multipunctata all over the world, having them in Scandinavia, Central Europe, and Canada, and in the United States, in different forms. And suddenly, the species gets extinct, gets extinct in the wild. Something happens, the, the habitat is gone. Okay, we managed to get the habitat back. We managed to restore the habitat and we're thinking of reintroducing the fish. Then we have the chance to pick Scandinavian fish. We have the chance to pick Central Europeans from the States, from Canada, getting all these varieties. And suddenly we, we get what we want or what we need for nature. We get this genetic diversity. We get the possibility of mixing all this color forms again by bringing them together in the founder populations from where we reproduce and from where we finally get the fish back. And this is nothing that is just a theoretical system. This is something that we did with Scythia francis, for example. We took fish from the United States, from the UK, from Germany, from Austria, and brought them together. And we observed something like a heterosis effect, that the population was stronger, 
started to vary a little bit and was able to easier adopt on the local habitat. So could this be done in a network? Of course, we are we're doing this. So the Good Eat Working Group is doing this, but we have also in the European Association of uh, the Austrian Association of Aquarists and. Uh, we have several projects where we focus on Alotoka, for example, or Alotontichtis polylepis, and there are zoos included, the hobbyists included, and with strict guidelines and with breeding programs and protocols. This is going to work properly, and we're doing this for almost 15, 20 years with a big success. But of course, you need to tell the privates how to do it. It's not like somebody knows everything and it's properly. We need to tell them how it's done. And on the other hand, when you look at the aquariums and the zoos, we have many, many zoos, but the capacity of aquariums is very low. And without the hobbyist sector, without the enthusiast sector, this is simply not possible. We need the mass of aquarium, we need the mass of hobbyists to help in this and that. The second one, this is a very quick one, uh, questions and answers. When we look at nature and see how things work with efficient nature, we also want to answer some questions and like we realized that, for example, Giardi Nichtis Multiradiatus is able to withstand conditions with oxygen, without oxygen for one hour or without, for 90 minutes. So they are living there in the mud, not breathing at all, not having no oxygen. This is something that we can't, we can't observe in the wild. We need to test this in the laboratory. But of course, this is not something where hobbyists can contribute. This is something that needs to stick in the laboratory of the university. But there are some things, some some other examples where hobbyists, of course, can can contribute and help us. We know that Alotoka Guslini became in, extinct in the wild around 2005, and we know that Xiphophorus hella reappeared in the same time frame. But is hella really the reason for Alotoka Guslini to get extinct? We know that in Dujitland, for example, the hella and Skip the other friends inside doesn't have any problem together, so it's working properly. But is this something that we can observe in the wild? No, because the fish is gone, so we need to have species to species projects and tests and uh, aquariums. And this is where hobbyists, for example, can contribute. They can say, okay, put the species together and see if both species of breeding and how big the offspring is and sending this to a central station that can be uh, compiled and for where we get the information. Same is with, uh, we have, well, I have to be honest, I have the feeling that the temperature may have an influence on sex ratio of good eats, but is this true? Is this just an idea that I have? We don't know. But it's something that we can test. Somebody can put a pair of good eats together. And when he realized, okay, they're coupled, so he put the female separate at 22 degrees and see what's coming up. How many fries do we have? How is the sex ratio? And send this also to a central station. And from there, we can take all the information and see what's coming up. And the influences on habitats is, is on, on reintroductions project is enormous. You can produce females and males on demand, for example. So this can be done in networks. This is something, of course, where you need to be more strict with the protocols and the guidelines, and you need controlled conditions and everything like this. But there's a lot of projects, and we had this in school in Hungary, where they tested Omega Splendens, for example, with two different kinds of foods and see how the, the, the fire was growing, how the adults were for health conditions and measures and everything. So there's a lot of, of answers that can be given by hobbyists when Universities are suit like take over the lead and give them the frame. That's a very important thing, I would say. So my final picture, and I've seen I've been in the time frame. So I hope Michael is happy. <laughs> I just took out the picture. So the left one is from a friend of mine from the Netherlands, both of from the Netherlands actually. Uh Arjan de Graaf, who has a huge collection of fish at home. And I hope he's not angry when I took this picture and, and put it in the presentation. And on the other hand, on the right hand, you see a breeding facility of Allodontichtis polylepis from the Rotterdam Zoo, also in the Netherlands. And do you see a big difference? In my opinion, not. So the cooperation in a network of hobbyists and zoos and universities is really something that we can, that we should focus on. And this is really something that's working properly. And finally, the plan G is something that's promoting it. So we are very open for corporations like this. So thank you for your attention, Jim. Uh, my email account is down there. So when somebody, somebody wants to write me an email anyway, of course. Thanks so much, Mike. That's really fascinating to hear more about your work and the working group's work to, to breed the species. 
Um, now we're going to hear from uh, Areli, um, who's going to talk about the conservation and reintroduction of two um, case study fish, the, the, the golden skiffia and the tequila split fin. And I had the pleasure this time last year to go and see the golden um, skiffia reintroduction in Teochitlan. And I can tell you it was quite an incredible affair. It was um, really fa fantastic to see. So looking forward to hearing what Arely says uh, about those reintroductions. Thank you so much. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, this big project that is developed here in Mexico. And there are many scientific students, uh, different research, uh, aquarium zoos, uh, association that they are participate in this, in this big project. So this project is in Tuchitlan River and it's located in Jalisco here in Mexico. And it's a really, really small lake. It's around one kilometer. However, this river has been modified by different human activities and disappear so many different species here. For example, Sobonetikus tequila and Esquipia francese uh, has been disappeared uh, from this uh, small river in central Mexico. So, however, uh, here in the university, in the Universidad Michoacana de San Nicolás de Hidalgo, uh, uh, we have the fish arc, that the fish arc, uh, we maintain 39 good date different species here. And some of these species were donated by different aquaries from uh, Europe or uh, another, uh, another countries. So in this place, we have uh, organisms from Sogoneticus tequila and Esquipia francense. And we create uh, two semi-natural ponds in the botanical garden here in the university. And in this, uh, in one pond, we put uh, uh, organisms from Esquipia francense and the other pond, we put Sogoneticus tequila. Uh, the first, this, the pond of Sogoneticus tequila was created in 2012. Uh, so, uh, this is the first project that we start. So in 2014, the Sogoneticus tequila project began uh, thanks to the international collaboration of SUS, Aquarius, and Scientifics. But uh, after to the, uh, before the reintroduction of the, the Sogoneticus tequila, uh, we have to evaluate different things. For example, uh, first, uh, we have to uh, monitor in the, uh, the fish that were introduced in the, in the feminatural pond. And in this small pond, we evaluate uh, how the fish are reproducing, how the fish are feeding, and if they are surviving to different uh, the predators that or the other species that they can uh, uh, have many problems. Because uh, Sogoneticus tequila used to live in aquarium for many, many years. So it's different when the fish uh, living in aquariums and every day you put the food. And it's different when you put the fish in a, a semi-natural pond in, and they uh, are getting their own uh, 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 feeding in the, in the natural habitat. So uh, we evaluate this part. Then we have to know uh, how was the river because the river had many different uh, human modification, but we need to know uh, how was, uh, uh, what other species are present and how is the water quality here in the river. So the result shows that uh, we found in 2015 five uh, native species. Uh, three of them, they were godates and one poesilid and a catfish. But also uh, we found exotic species, some uh, guppies species and a tilapia. So uh, in this, uh, we found that the exotic species were more abundant uh, that the native species and the exotic species are established in other river and the native species uh, were only in the spring zone or in the in the in the headwaters so about the quality water uh, we found that uh, the best quality water was in the spring zone uh, in this area right now it's uh, it's modificating like a pool so you can go to swim in there and the last part of the river it's uh, very polluted compared with the, the first part of the river uh, based on the results, uh, we have to the, take the decision where, what, where we are going to reintroduce Sogoneticus tequila. So in the uh, headwaters uh, are be better conditions, uh, the water, better water uh, quality, and 
And so we decided to put, uh, to reintroduce the Sogoneticus tequila in the headwaters, in the spring zones. So we take some of the Sogoneticus tequila uh, uh, from the botanical garden and we transport it to the, the reintroduced area that is in this pool. However, uh, before to reintroduce the fish, uh, we uh, put a mark in the fish that looks like, like a tattoo. And uh, we put different marks in all the gote and on all the sogoneticos because we want to know when the fish are reproducing in the new place, uh, the old fish, we are going to present the mark and the new babies or the new uh, sogoneticos uh, will don't have the, the mark. So we uh, made the reintroduction and it was a really interesting reintroduction with a little people uh, from the lab and, and some participants from the Chester Zoo. And then two years, uh, uh, two years after, we monitoring the reintroduced species, so Oneticus tequila, two students who are working in their thesis about uh, the cow, cow so Oneticus tequila is feeding and reproducing in, in, the, in the new habitat in the, in the Tuchitlan River. And we noticed that it, uh, we found incredible news because uh, Sogoneticus tequila was already established in the Huge Land River. Uh, we found that uh, Sogoneticus tequila uh, was reproducing and feeding in the new habitat and all the fish don't present the, the, the mark that indicate that, uh, that there were new fish uh, that they born in the spring area of the Huge Land River. However, uh, we continued monitoring uh, the, the Sogoneticus tequila and more years uh, uh, after we found that Sogoneticus tequila is moving to new areas in the Tuchitlan River because we were introduced in the spring zone in the headwaters of the river and right now Sogoneticus tequila is also in another part of the river that is very close to the La Vega Dam and in this part, uh, there are another spring area and we can find right now Sogoneticus tequila reintroduced there. So with this project, uh, we are, uh, it, it's participated for many, many people, but uh, we are very happy because with this project, we re reverse the extinction of Sogoneticus tequila. Because before this project, uh, Sogoneticus tequila, according to the red list of the Trinity species, uh, it was extinct in the wheel, and right now uh, in the in the red list is in danger. So we with this project we reverse the extinction of the of this uh, this small fish from central central Mexico. So this this was really really incredible news. But right now we are working in another species that it's all uh, also extinct in the wheel. That is Esquifia francesa. So this Esquifia francesa, uh, also we have a pond, seminatural pond in the botanical garden. So they are reproducing here. Also, we want to evaluate the same or use the same protocols that we use in the Sogoneticus tequila project. And uh, we monitoring uh, in the botanical garden uh, how Esquifia francesa are reproducing, how they are feeding in these natural seminatural ponds. And then we want to do the same protocol that we make with uh, Sogoneticus tequila. So we also put uh, some marks in the fish uh, and also we reintroduce here in the Tuchitlan River in the spring area. Here in this reintroduction, many people participate because the social part uh, was very consolidated. So uh, here in Tuchitlan, uh, there are a big group of enthousi enthusiastic people uh, that they are working, that they are called um, Guardianes del Rio. But I don't want to talk too much about this group because Perla is going to talk about more about this. But uh, in this reintroduction, uh, many people participate here in the reintroduction of Esquifia Francesa. However, uh, the fish uh, did not survive. Mm, we don't know what is happening with this uh, reintroduction because we try to do the same protocols that in Sogoneticus tequila. Uh, for this reason, we start to create uh, experiments on mesocons. Uh, so some students, they are doing their thesis, uh, evaluate if the Esquifia Francesa presents some water problems in the river, 
if they have competition competition between uh, species with Esquifia francesa, because uh, uh, the Tichlan River, there are too many exotic species. So uh, with these experiments, we want to know uh, what about what happened with Esquifia francesa, why the, the fish didn't survive. Uh, the results show uh, that uh, the tilapia, it's a really invasive species uh, here in the Tuchitlan River. So we need to control in the spring area uh, before they're introduced to Esquifia francesa. So right now we are working in this part to how control the tilapia and the other uh, poecilids that they are living here in the Tuchitlan Rivers because uh, we know notice that uh, Scyphia francesa it's a more sensitive species than Sogoneticus tequila, and the color of this Scyphia francesa is really uh, yellow, and probably this is a problem to reintroduce with the other species because they think that it's food or they think that it's tortilla because uh, people used to feed with tortilla uh, the tilapias here in the Tuchitlan River, so probably they think that the skiffia are tortilla and they are biting or eating uh, some of the skiffias. So right now we are working in this, in this part of the project. Uh, as I said, uh, social aspect is really, really important in all the conservation project, but uh, Perla is going to talk about most, more about this incredible project that they are doing or, and all the incredible activities that they are uh, doing in, in the Tuchitlan River. However, uh, we would like so we will work together with the guardians of the river to reverse the extinction of the Esquifia francesa, because right now, according to the red list, Esquifia francesa is extending the wheel. So I hope that soon uh, we can also reverse the extinction of this species and, and in, together with the guardians uh, of the river. So uh, this is, thank you, uh, that this is all. And I want to thank all for your support. And if you have any comments or questions, you can uh, send an email to Omar Dominguez or me. Uh, I, 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 the presentation was very short because for the time, but if you have any questions, you can uh, send us um, a an, an message and we can try to, to talk about uh, the conservation project. And thank you. Thank you so much, Arely. And yes, absolutely. Please do fire in your questions. We're going to have about half an hour at the end to talk through um, to talk through any questions that you may have. So feel free to send some in. Uh, so now we've heard from Topis about the policy side of this program and Mike about the ex situ breeding and how passionate home Aquarius can be involved and Arely about the conservation strategy. And now we can learn about the community approach. Uh, when, I, when I visited the Golden Skiffia reintroduction last year, I was really struck by the incredible levels of engagement from the community. Um, to tell you the truth, I've, I've never really seen anything like it in a conservation program. As I already mentioned, it's, uh, it, was, it was really impressive. There were murals painted throughout the town from the Guardianes del Rio Teuchitlan, uh, encouraging people to engage with looking after the species and waterways. Uh, and during the reintroduction itself, it seemed like the entire town was there. There was there was music and dancing and people dressed in traditional ind indigenous clothing who led a procession to the river to reintroduce the fish. It was really remarkable. Um, so Perla, we'd, we'd love to hear from you about the, the community work to conserve the Teochitlan Teo River and its native species. Hi, guys. Okay, let me share with you this I prepared for you. Okay, Tommy, can't you see that? Yeah, we can see that. Yeah, okay, so let's start. Okay, so I'm just a member from Guardianes del Rio de Chitlán. So Guardianes del Rio, Guardians of the River, cool name, what, right? What? Who are we? Okay. Oh my God. Wait a minute for me. I'm thinking I'm having some trouble with this. Tell me, are you able to see my screen? Yeah, we can see it. Okay. 
Okay, so let's continue. Okay, so we are a group of citizens from Guadalajara, from Tuchitlan, Jalisco. We work together with people from town, with church authorities, on our principal focus are kids from town who voluntarily are joining us to learn about this project, to learn about the fish. So at the very beginning, it was just a group of people. It was just uh, Consuelo Rivera. And so everything started in 2018 when Federico Hernandez, we can see here, okay, Federico Hernandez was looking for some people to join this project after the reintroduction of Sogeneticos tequila fish. As uh, Arely mentioned before, in the reintroduction, they were just um, some people from the Universidad of Michoacán, some people from uh, the biologist group from this Chester Zoo. And so after this event, they were looking for people to join them to work. So until 2029, we started a new group of people. As you can see, this is the first picture we have with uh, some kids from town. We were cleaning, we were removing uh, some trash from the river. So that's how we started in 2021. Okay, so we have been doing a lot of uh, projects, a lot of work. And some of them are the environmental education workshops in which we try to make children aware of what's going on with the fish. So they know about the fish and about how to take care of the environment, right? Because it's really important. One of our <laughs> projects are a fun summer. A fun summer is a summer course in which we invite people, we invite kids from all the town, from different places. So they just come come up and start working in how to take care of the fish. We teach them uh, about uh, who is a fish, who is working, how to take care about the threats of the fish. So this is very important and also very fun because they learn while playing, while developing and while creating different things. Okay, another of our events are uh, the Yasabologist workshops. In these workshops, they learn some characteristics of the fish. Uh, people from the Uni University of uh, San Nicolas Hidalgo came, sorry, from the Ciudad de Michoacán, they come and they teach us about the fish, about the physical characteristics, about how to take care, about the quality of the water, and also, we have the interpretative trails in which we learn about the water, about the river, about the fauna, about the, all the animals living there. And it's just very amazing. This is, <laughs> in here, in this picture, we are just uh, just breathing after the interpretative trail because we were all like, super tired. <laughs> Okay, so now let's talk about Creation Time Week. This is a huge event we hold every year in order to honor St. Francis of Assisi, who is the patron saint um, for those who work for the ecology. So the way we celebrate this is by creating, by making a parade, an ecological parade, okay? <laughs> so we invite people from town, and here is not only kids, but people, but adults, but schools, working together in order to celebrate this event. This is, this was so impressive because during this week, we invite people to participate in a cleaning campaign. So we were, we were hoping for the bells to ring, the bells from the church, and in the moment we heard the bells ringing, everybody start cleaning the, the streets, cleaning the river. So it was a huge event, a massive event in which everybody participated. So it was so, so amazing. And at the end of the week, 
uh, we have an Eucharistical celebration with people from church. So people from church are very key important pieces of this project. Later on, I'm going to let you know why. Okay, so we have also river maintenance campaigns in which we invite uh, some institutions from such as Kobae, that is a high school, uh, Udeje High School. Um, you can see here the prices of the church uh, cleaning the river. So this is a teamwork. This is a teamwork in which everybody's involved and everybody's happy. Um, pay attention because I'm going to show you something impressive. Okay. This is before and this is after the cleaning campaigns. So it is just impressive. And I want to tell you something. At the very beginning, before uh, everything happened, it was just one person, one person going every day, cleaning the river, removing the lechuguilla, removing the lily from the river. Okay? Just one person. And now, after this event, after everything that has happened, it's super normal to go to the river and see people, like normal people, just... Uh, taking out some trash, uh, picking trash, removing the litter from the river. So it's it's amazing. It's amazing what what it can be done, right? Just by watching the other doing something, you just uh, came up and join this activity. So it's awesome. Okay, so now let's talk about the dissemination mechanisms to promote environmental education in the community. Okay, we have done different activities in order to promote uh, these, to promote these activities. Um, one of them is the world newspaper at the end of the mass. So there are some people from Bordines del Rio waiting for the people coming out from, from the celebration and they just start sharing information about this. Also, uh, we got these bulletins, informative bulletins, in which we invite people to make part, to join the events we're going to help. And of course, uh, you can find our Facebook page as Guardianes del Rio de Chislan. Actually, I'm the one in charge of, <laughs> of the page. So if you send us a message, a message, I will be there, okay? So another of the things we have done is the wall paintings in which we share some quotes about uh, environmental care. The purpose of these wall paintings is to make people aware of what's going on, to try to make uh, awareness of the situation. So as it says, agua que no se toma deja de contaminar. So it's very really shocking because these wall paintings is near to the touristic zone. So all people to come to see the Guachimontones, the ecological zone in Tuchitlan, is able to watch this, to see this uh, wall paintings, and it's just amazing. So as I told you, we are a team. So we work together with many institutions, with many people here. Uh, these little kids here are from a kindergarten that is called Justo Sierra Kindergarten. They created a song for Skipia Francesa and they, they held an event in which uh, they commemorate the fish. So this event was so, uh, so big that many schools from the song adopted the event, adopted the song. So we are talking that not only people or schools from Tochitlan Jalisco get this project, but also schools near the zone. So that's awesome because we are moving to other communities like promoting the change, promoting uh, this care about the fish. So also we have some uh, kids from the high school, with the high school who have helped us a lot with uh, the removal of video and also they help us with some events we have held. And as you can see, Kobe High School is also uh, a key part of this uh, collaboration because 
we have health projects as actually about the fish. In this situation, they were asking uh, some students from the University of Michoacan to give them some information so they can they could participate in an in another uh, project. And people from church, um, they are just vital. They are just a key piece of the project. We have Prior uh, Gustavo and we have uh, the Bishop in Alberto Polina, who is native from Tuchitlan also. They have support us, they have give us all of the workshops that we have uh, done are, are held in the church. They give us a space in the church so we can join with the kids. That's like our safe place we, in which we can meet the, the kids, the children. So, and also they help us with the promoting of the project. So during the Eucharistic celebrations, they just share with people in town about the project and they invite people. So they are key pieces on this project. Now let's talk about what Arelisa told some minutes before. So we have an event called Esquifia for Siempre, Esquifia Forever. Okay, so it was held in the last year in November the 4th. Um, this event was uh, taken in two parts. The first part was an academic event or an event in which we recognize the first generations of Pequeños Guardianes del Rio, the first generation of kids who participated in this event. So since they were with us since the very beginning, so it was like their prom. <laughs> so from Guardianes del Rio, we recognize people who have worked with us on also uh, the second part of the event was a cultural event in which a play was held in order to tell the story of how Skifia uh, came from the dead, was reborn, and how now is alive well, in that moment, right? So the event was a uh, a really big event. I had the opportunity to meet some of you there. So we have this altar, uh, altar de muertos, in which we commemorate the Skifia. In this uh, other picture, we can see like the very moment in which they were reintroduced in the fish. And this is very shocking also because in the first reintroduction, like the one of the fish, the Sogeneticus de Kila fish, it was just a group of people. And in this event, some years after, later on, we we were about 300 people, 200 people. So the impact was just so much. And it was a beautiful event in which we can commemorate the fish. We can became aware of what, what's going on with the fish because, okay, so now, a Dios lo cuidamos todos. This is uh, our principal quote. So in which we are so happy to work uh, with everybody. We are so happy to see all the progress we have done. So um, thank you so much. I think this is all. Amazing. Thank you so much, Perla. Um, that, that photo that you showed of the before and after of the river is so, impe so impressive. Uh, and to see the local community come together like that to collectively improve the natural environment really shows what can be achieved with people power. Um, you mentioned it was originally just one person going out every day to clean the river. How long did it take before other people started responding and getting involved themselves? I mean, it has been such a process. It has been such a process because since the very beginning, people really didn't know what's going on. They didn't, uh, they didn't even know the, the fish. So I think and maybe in the first year, we, we got many people joining us. And now I think it's like our best time because we got many friends, we got many institutions helping us. And we are 
just uh, keep working on this project. Brilliant. It's um, it's also really impressive to see what has already been achieved with the Golden Skiffia and the Tequila Split Fin um, with a relatively a very small amount of funding and really exciting to think that this highly threatened and, and fascinating group of fishes could be saved through mobilizing this action plan. Um, question for you, Harmony, um, what most excites you about this program? I think um, one thing that's really unique about it is it's one of the few, if only, that I am familiar with uh, conservation plans that tackles a whole group of fishes, uh, especially one that's extremely threatened, as uh, Paul mentioned in his talk the very high proportion of the subfamily is is extremely threatened and they're micro endemics so their habitats are also very vulnerable um i think also um following on uh perla's presentation the involvement with the local community um the church the guardianos del rio um, and then also the partnership with Chester Zoo and Universidad de Michoacan and um, the Freshwater Conservation Committee and the Goodyear Working Group, everyone who's been involved in the process. It's been a very, um, very comprehensive process because we've been able to involve all these different stakeholders. And I think, you know, I think most people watching this webinar are probably familiar with the kind of frightening statistics about the extinction crisis that freshwater biodiversity is facing. And um, these species are the perfect example of, you know, a poster child somewhat for, um, action that can be taken to to make a difference to stop extinctions so i think you know the plan really lays out a, a clear strategy and um it, by implementing it we can we can save we can save these the beautiful special as uh paul said weird uh evolutionary <laughs> distinct uh uh special fish Yeah, brilliant. And um, yeah, I'd, I'd just like to uh, say again that uh, we've got half an hour for questions. So if anybody has any questions at all, even if they're unsure about asking it, then um, it, it may help benefit uh, other people to hear the answer as well. So please do ask away. Paul, I'm going to ask you a question as I forced you to rush through your presentation at the start. Um, what for you has been the most rewarding thing about bringing this plan together, seeing it come to life? Um, this webinar. <laughs> no, the, the action plan to conserve the community. No, I mean, I mean, the webinar has been the cherry on the pie. This has been it. Oh. Um, no, um, I, the, the whole thing is, uh, I mean, this, um, yeah, it's, it's I, I guess, building community has been a really key thing. Um, I mentioned during my presentation that, you know, that there's been this whole long story of collaboration with Chester Zoo and also many other collections with the fish arc. Uh, from Chester Zoo's point of view, you know, this relationship started in, in the year 2000 with, with nearly a quarter of a century in, which is quite a sobering time frame. Um, Toppies mentioned back then Gordon McGregor Reed, uh, who's a very key. I, it was amazing when we were out in Mexico last year, all of these sort of stakeholders from across Mexico who work with Good Aids, all of them talking about Gordon and, and the role that he played. I've never met Gordon McGregor Reed, uh, but but through this process of, of being involved in this workshop. Um, so he was a, a former um, CEO. I don't know if the word CEO was used back then at Chester, but a, a former head, shall we say, of, of Chester Zoo. And, and he was very 
um, influential in, in the early days of the Mexico fish arc and, and, and very involved with Mexican fish conservation circles. Um, so I, I learned a lot about the history of the organization that I work for through this community that built up around the workshop. I met all of the people that you see on screen here today who are people I've never met before and who I've very much enjoyed working with. Um, even Becky Goodwin from the Chester Zoo Aquarium, never met before. And, I, you know, th this is about fish, not people, but the two kind of come together. Um, freshwater ecosystems are something that all life depends on. And there's this parallel where communities can say you build up communities of practice of, of colleagues of collaborators and you develop an, an ecosystem where everyone comes with their skill set and their experience and, and there's it's a nice kind of parallel with you know conservation needs to look at the community and the ecosystem not just a species but all of the other species that interact with that species and all the other biotic and abiotic factors within their ecosystem so it's you know, there's there's this parallel between building communities of people for conservation and reinforcing or restoring uh, natural communities and natural ecosystems for their conservation. Um, I'm aware that's a very unfocused answer, but I'm just following a train of thought here. That's <laughs> where it's taken me. So <laughs> I hope that's okay for you, Michael. <laughs> Uh, no, no, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to um, jump in with that. I would just well, want to build up on that one. You know, Paul, uh, in 2025, it's going to be 25 years since the Chester started working with the uh, uh, with, uh, University of Michoacan. And it's going to be 20 years since the creation of the Freshwater Fish Specialist Group. So let's start planning the celebration. And we can invite Gordon. We'll have an anniversary party. It'd be good to meet Gordon at last. That's <laughs> so much about him. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Michael, I, I don't know if you noticed it. There was a question that came up uh, a while back on the chat during Michael Kirk's presentation. Uh, I've got it on screen. Do you want me to, to read it out? Yeah, yeah. Sure thing. Um, so this was from Sandy Moore. Um, and the question is... Um, while I understand why you, I guess this is directed at, at Michael in reference to his presentation. While I understand why you wouldn't want to work with hobbyists to actually repopulate the natural environment, is there a reason why you wouldn't work with the fish farming industry? I guess it's me to answer. <laughs> uh, well, of course we want to work with hobbyists and we want to include hobbyists in the uh, because in in repopulations uh, actions, uh, the way simply we cannot take the fish and put them directly in the habitats. We need to bring them in a semi-captive area to breed them under semi-captive conditions to prepare the fish to be reintroduced into the wild. Just imagine you're feeding the fish at home, so you do, they know when somebody's coming to the aquarium, feeding the fish and that and all this stuff. And two legs in the hobby means the feeder. Two legs in the wild means the uh, predator, for example, get a stork or something else and getting or the egret and getting the fish out. So they have to be careful. They have to get adjusted and all this stuff and get also rid of the exotic uh, exotic diseases they have. Normally, the aquarists don't have only good eats at home. They have guppies and neon tetras from Southeast Asia and bringing the diseases from there and infecting also the good eats by transporting water with the nets from one aquarium to another one. So these are things that we need to care of. Uh, the fish producing, fish farming industry, I never thought of this, to be honest. It would be great to have them on board. Absolutely, definitely, because the capacity is there. I just was thinking they are more in producing fish for the market. I have been asked by several pet shops and wholesalers for good eats, but of course, this is a short way, taking the fish and selling them, not thinking about conservation or anything like this. But when the fish farming industry would be interested to dedicate certain quantity of their capacity to, to conservation of, of freshwater fish, not only good eats, but in general, would be amazing, of course. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 ultimately this, this <clears throat> kind of innovative and large scale ambitious project really rests on the the four strands, doesn't it? The, the, the local communities, the conservation work, um, 
the the policy side of things and very much the the, the breeders the passionate home aquarists who often actually know more about the species than than the conservationists i mean the, the goodyear working group has such a a huge bank of knowledge and information about these about these fish and there's lots of very passionate and knowledgeable breeders throughout the world as well um how do you think mike they could um they could get more involved i know there's a lot of them on this on this webinar listening in so i'm sure they'd love to hear what they can do to to help out address me again uh yeah that's okay, okay yeah sorry <laughs> yeah uh well, like there are countless things where hobbyists can can support this plant. I mentioned a lot of them before, like breeding backup populations, giving presentations, for example, in aquarium clubs, clubs talking about the threats of these, uh, writing articles in, in magazines, uh, but also talking about success, breeding success, or problems they have in an aquarium, just to get more more knowledge about the fish in general, or funding, funding especially specific, specific projects. So when there's a project running and I'm sure we will have a lot of them in the plant sheet and you are dedicated to one species and you have some money left, we would be happy and very grateful to, grateful to get whatever we can get from you. And I'm sure there are many, many things where hobbyists can contribute that we're not thinking about at this point because they're just not in our minds. But the plant sheet is not, not a static construct. It's not isolated. It's not the administrative team, it's we all, I would say. So the plan G is, let's say the membership for being part of the plan G is your dedication to good eat conservation. So at the end, everybody, everybody is listening. Every archivist who is interested in good eats is a member of the plan G and can, can contribute by even ask us to implement some things that would be interested from his point of view. And it doesn't matter if you're running a public aquarium with 20 or 30 aquariums with good eats or just have one species in your kitchen tank. Everybody is welcome and let's change the world a little bit better, I would say. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Be Becky's been sitting very patiently, quietly at the back. Becky, I'm so sorry that we've not given you a, an opportunity to speak yet. Um, I I'd love to hear from you, Becky what challenges you have found th throughout the plan. Um, firstly, with the, the tequila split fin and the golden skiffier, and also with this um, integrated action plan for the other species. Um, so for me, I haven't actually had too many direct problems with anything to do with skiffier or with the tequila split fin. I think that's mostly been Aralee and the um, everyone at the university that have had to deal with all of that bit. Um, but for, for me and for going forward, um, I think it's been, it's quite difficult with some of the, the time zones. So I think it's great that we get to work with people from different countries and it's it's one of the nicer bits about it as well. But trying to coordinate us all to be in the, in the same place and find out the information is quite hard for that. Um, and then going forward, just trying to gather all of the information that we can. Um, so we want to try and get information of what we don't know from everybody who's keeping them and trying to find out all the bits that where we're where we're missing. Brilliant. Thank you. And we, we have a question from I'm not actually sure who it's from, so I apologize for that. But um could uh firstly they say thank you to all the panelists for their wonderful presentations. I'd second that. But could could you speak a little about um given how overlooked freshwater conservation is worldwide, what is it that keeps you motivated and optimistic? And what are the opportunities coming up that you're most excited about? If anyone wants to jump in on that, what what keeps you uh what keeps you motivated and optimistic? Oh, projects like the the Sogonicticus tequila, conservation works. That mo motivates us to go and, and do more projects like that one. Uh, you know, we don't we can't give up, and we can make a change, and we know we can make a change. Conservationists, uh, by definition, are optimists. No, we think we can save species. We can think we can change the world. Yeah, we're always motiv motivated in spite of the crisis going on. So yeah, we'll keep on working. 
Any, anybody else? Harmony, what, what excites you? What makes you optimistic about it? I mean, I just love freshwater fish, number one. So I just think they're the coolest animals ever, ever created. Um, and I love getting the chance to get out in the rivers and lakes and wetlands once in a while when I do. Um, and like Topas said, this this knowledge that there's this urgency, this extinction crisis facing all these freshwater species, that that drives me to continue. I just got this kind of constant drumming in the back of my mind of like, you, you have to keep going, you're racing against time because um, species, you know, could be going extinct before they're even described by scientists. We describe, you know, roughly 200 odd new species of freshwater fish every year. And, um, you know, how many are lost before they're even described. And so, and I just think, you know, they're, they're evolutionarily incredible creatures and they have a inherent right to exist. And I'm going to, you know, put my time and effort to protecting their right to exist. Brilliant. Brilliant. Um, some, I think, I think it might be anonymous, but this is a broad question. And for any of the panelists, I think probably it would be best if Areli and Mike answer, but everyone feel free to jump in. Is there any extra reading material you guys could recommend for somebody looking to research further into good Yeah. Yes. Uh, we have uh, some uh, papers that we can uh, share with the community about uh, the process of the reintroduction of Sogenetics tequila and what we are doing with the speaker Francesa. And also we have uh, the thesis of the students. They are in Spanish, but we can also uh, share this kind of information. Is, is there somewhere that we can um, that we can direct people to to where they where they could find out more? I think uh, it's also in the Godating Working Group that Michael notes about that. So in the Godating Working Group but that it's online, it's also a lot of information about the Godate. Brilliant, thank you. And Maria D'Amico asks, do you all have ideas on the most pressing research and knowledge gaps there are that somebody could work on ex situ? Again, that's possibly possibly to Mike, but maybe to Aureli. Or Becky yeah. as well. Or, or Becky or anyone. You're probably being too quiet again. Um uh, yeah, yes and no. <laughs> um so yes, we're definitely getting ideas. And one of the things I'd quite like to get some idea like a list of some ideas that anybody could contribute to. So we could eat, sort of each individually do little experiments and then try and gather that together. But one of the things that I'm definitely trying to work on is um knowing, I think I vaguely said it before, is knowing where where we're missing information. So for ex situ particularly, um we're not we need a bit more information to know where we're missing information. So we're gonna try and um get some get gather it together, hopefully send out a survey at some point in the next soon year <laughs> um, to basically everybody who's keeping them and try and work out what what we're missing. And then going forward, we can then try and get that into, um, get some research done for it. Can, can I mention something? Becky, I think that's a brilliant idea. You know, don't do something related to uh, citizen science, but in aquariums, normally we use citizens and science to register species to, but you know, this uh, constructed uh, collective construction of, of knowledge uh, framework would be excellent if we get uh, aquarists, individual aquarists, uh, trying to work together to solve some of these uh, pressing questions. Of course, we have to formulate the questions, but but yeah, that that would be something we should. We should promote and and support some way. Yeah, I think it would be a, a good idea. Like if there's even just some simple 
questions and way of answering them that we could have prepared that then people can dip into when when they can and then we could put all that information back together and it's not quite the same as one one larger scale project but um it would definitely give us a lot of information that we don't currently have uh a, a new question's come in from Art, who says it's very informative and motivating. Uh, just to put things into perspective, how many tequila split fin specimens were actually reintroduced to the ecosystem? Um, and were they all reintroduced at the same time or over a period of time? Okay, uh, about the reintroduction of Sogoneticus tequila, we reintroduced only one time, uh, 1,500 uh, specimens uh, in the headwaters of the river. And then we start monitoring every two months uh, uh, how the population is growing out uh, and how they are reproducing and feeding in the, in the spring area. So it was only in one time. Well, and it was the same with the um with the golden skiffia, wasn't it? There was there was a few kind of as a trial were were released to to ensure that they would make the step from the mesocosms, the kind of uh, artificial um uh, areas in the natural environment, to to ensure that they would then be uh, healthy and robust enough to survive in the wild. And they did. And then after after the first initial release of of a few, there was it was kind of twelve twelve hundred, I think, was it that were released all all in one go. More religious. Brilliant. And definitely important to mention that um, data suggests that the reintroductions, both reintroductions have been very successful and numbers are rising. And tequila split fin's been reassessed, hasn't it? And it's no longer extinct in the wild. It's now, um, is it now endangered from being extinct in the wild? Yeah, it's in danger. It's gone, 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 through, skipped out, critically endangered, gone to endangered, and the numbers are increasing. So, as, as Topis says, it works. Conservation works. We have every reason to be optimistic and and think that this program, this um, method, will work for all the other species of of goodie that are as, as just as just as um just as threatened. Um. So we have a few more minutes. Um. Topis, here's a, here's a question for you. What's the next step on, on this integrated action plan and what do we need to do to ensure that it becomes a success? Well, first of all, we need to translate it to Spanish and start uh, <clears throat> moving in and around here in the country to get more people, more uh, local governments, more uh, uh, local organizations like Guardianes involved and and yeah, we I, I even was discussing this with the people in my lab. Well, we're uh we might talk to uh Areli, Omar and others to do a seminar like this one, but in Spanish. But we need the, the document uh, and 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 start uh you know having meetings with uh the National Biodiversity Commission, the Protected Area Commission, with uh environmental ministry they participated in the plan you know some people but we need to go to other levels to start lobbying with them even go to congress and stuff so yeah but it, you always need to come with a document and it's not uh polite to go with a document in english he was mexican so, so yeah that's the, the, the first thing we need to have and then do all the political and loving work that I, I I do a lot. For for the record, for for the attendees present, the reason why we don't have yet this this document yet ready in Spanish is because of me being slow, but it's coming. Apologies. <laughs> no, no, no. We need to work together to do that. Yes. Uh, but yeah, we need it. Uh, we need it now. Yeah, but it took me this long to get the English version ready, though. <laughs> It's a lot of work, Paul. It's a lot of work, um, and that 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 um, uh, the action plan is now published and ready in English, and it's currently available on the Shoal website. I'm sure it'll be made available on on lots of other websites soon. But if people want to go and take a look at that, they can they can jump over to the Shoal website and have a look 
um, Paul and um, Harmony have just put some extra reading material in the chat. So if anybody's keen to read a little bit more, please head over to um, head over to those links and take a look. Thank you so much to all the panelists. It's really exciting to see this ambitious, large scale program ready to be rolled out um, and really fantastic, heartening to see the level of community involvement that is um, that's desperately needed to ensure this program sustainability and how it partners passionate home fish keepers uh, with the conservationists. Um, and this, this kind of collaboration between the local communities, the conservationists and the home breeders is, is a really exciting pro approach that greatly increases the chances of success. The tequila split fin and the golden skiffy case studies that are really, and uh, Perla mentioned are extremely positive evidence that this method will be successful. So once again, I'd like to say thank you so much for, for joining us today. Um, this recording will be available on the Shoal website, social media, YouTube channel later today. If you've not already, please sign up to Shoal's newsletter. Um, the details are on the website, which will provide regular updates about this program and other freshwater conservation news. You can find out more about the amazing work hobbyists are doing to boost populations of Mexican goodyards at the Goodyard Working Group, sorry, goodyardworkinggroup.com. Um, and please stay engaged with all, all the excellent work the panelists are doing. It really helps us protect and conserve the freshwater species that we all love. Um, I'd also just like to take this opportunity to mention that Mexico is one of the leading countries on supporting the Freshwater Challenge, which is a, a country-led initiative launched at the UN Water Conference in New York in March this year with the objective to restore 300,000 kilometers of rivers and 350 million hectares of wetlands by 2030. At the Latin America and Caribbean Regional Climate Week held in Panama last week, Ms. Carol Hernandez Gonzalez, the Environmental Director for the Mexican Ministry of Foreign Affairs, led an event highlighting the importance of the freshwater challenge and its objectives to conserve freshwater ecosystems. The event was also strongly supported by government representatives from Colombia, Ecuador, and Panama. And thanks to the support of Mexico and these other countries, the message of freshwater ecosystem conservation is being carried through to the UN Climate Change Conference, COP28, that will occur in Dubai in December. The only other final thing for me to say now is Happy Halloween or Feliz Dia de los Muertos. And um, yeah, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Michael, for all your hard work on this. Of course, Paul and everybody. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, everyone, for your presentations. And it's been a real honor working on this together. All right. Thank you. Then. Thank you, Michael, again. And, uh, thank you. Sorry for making your heart beat at the beginning. <laughs> it was not the plan. Sorry, it didn't work. All right. Thanks.